Well, welcome to our course, uh, Activating the Gifts of the Spirit. You know, one of the things that uh, we have learned over years is that God has created every person to be a supernatural or a spiritual being with a capacity to function not only in a natural world, but also to access the realm of the Spirit, the access where God is, and to bring heaven to earth. God's desire is that you be a channel for heaven coming to earth for his presence and goodness and healing and love and, and peace and prosperity to flow through you and to manifest in the world around you. So in this course, we'll be teaching about that supernatural dimension. We'll teach about how miracles are activated, what the keys are around that. We'll teach you uh, what the foundational key is, is out of intimacy with God and hearing the voice of God. And we'll give you practical steps, practical keys, how to start from wherever you are right now and step by step grow your faith so you can be starting to operate successfully and regularly and confidently in the gifts of the Spirit. So in the course, we'll teach on the gifts of the Spirit. We'll give you a little bit about each. We'll also give you some foundational uh, understanding about the spirit man and how God works in and through us. And also, if you're watching this by DVD, you'll see demonstrations of the power of God touching people. You'll see demonstrations of how to move uh, in words of knowledge, hearing the voice of God, minister to people. You'll see all of that in this course, and it will inspire you and help you. God's given me ability to make it extremely clear, and I know that you are going to really enjoy this. Put in the effort, invest in yourself, do the course, and put into practice the things you learn, and you'll just be overjoyed when you see God is far more willing to work through you than you really realize. His plan is that the kingdom come into the earth through you. All you've got to do is learn how to do it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant of spiritual gifts. And this course is to help solve that problem. God bless you. Have a great time on the course. And may you extend the kingdom of God boldly. God bless. Everyone and welcome to our seminar on activating the gifts of the Spirit. And for those of you who are watching uh, uh, on the internet or watching uh, through television, we want to welcome you too. Uh, I trust that you'll download off the internet the manual you'll need and you can just follow it through with us. And I encourage you, if you're in a group, that you just practice with the people who are in the group. Remember, it's just a practice. Life is just a practice. And so as you practice, you'll get feedback from the person and you'll be able to explore what it is to hear the voice of God and to flow with the gifts of the Spirit. So we're going to start in this first session. And the first session, we're going to look at the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, in your notes, it's uh, section 2. Uh, and we're going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. And in verse 1, it says, Now concerning uh, spiritual gifts or concerning uh, operations of the Spirit, brothers, I would not have you to be ignorant. So Paul is writing to the church. And notice here's the first thing. He wa God wants you to move in the supernatural. You are designed to be a supernatural being. You are a spirit being living inside a body. With your body, you can communicate with the external world. With your spirit, you can communicate with the realm of God with the realm of the Spirit. So you are designed to flow and access with the supernatural realm of God. So you don't have to become a spiritual person. You already are spiritual. You already have a spirit dimension to you. Your natural body has five senses. You can see, you can hear, you can taste, touch, smell. Your spirit man also has spiritual senses. With your physical senses, you can interact with the physical world. You receive signals and whatever. And from that, you can begin to uh, identify certain things. It's the same in your spirit. Many people haven't developed their spiritual capacity. So the first thing is, you are a spirit being, and God wants you to operate supernaturally. That's his plan. And so Paul writes, I don't want you to be ignorant of the supernatural realm or how to work with the Holy Spirit. The word ignorant means having no practical experience or understanding of this. So the reason things are hard is because we don't know how. And over the seminar, we want to take away the mystery of how hard it is and make it, it's actually really simple. Everything that God does is incredibly simple. And it requires just an open heart to receive. 
So you don't have to be highly educated to move in the supernatural. You don't have to be highly educated to flow with the Holy Spirit. He will use anyone. He will just open their life up and say, God, I, here I am. I'm available. Work through me. So God will work through. So the first thing then is that God wants us to be empowered and equipped to bring his power to people. The church has long uh, lost the flow of power, but now in these days God is restoring power back to the church. And we'll see part of the Great Commission is that you be anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit and you, you are able to lay hands on the sick, you are able to minister to people, you are able to flow with the Holy Spirit. And that makes sense because the world isn't going to come into a church building. The church is to go to the world and bring God to the world. And so we want to show you how to do this and we want to teach you how to work with the Holy Spirit in a, uh, uh, an environment where you're just practicing and learning. And then your journey is to develop what you learn and grow it. Don't wait for some revival and don't wait for some big experience. Take what we give you and teach you and begin to apply it and practice it, and you'll get better and better and better. God is more willing to use you than you realize. Okay, this is the first thing. Second thing is, and we're going to talk a little bit about the gifts of the Spirit themselves. If you go down to verse 7, now the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. So notice here, it uses the word manifestation. That word manifestation means very simply this. It means something that's visible, tangible, that people can see. So he's saying God wants to operate through you in a way that's tangible, that people can experience him. I prophesied over someone the other day. I brought a word from God to them, and I shared with them things God showed me that was so personal and so connected to that person that when I asked them, how did this affect you? They said, I felt like my whole life was open before God and he was here talking to me personally. So the gifts of the Spirit are manifestations of a person, the Holy Spirit. So it's not like you have some kind of gift. You have a person and you work with him to bring his life forth. Huh? So it's all about a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And notice the thing here, it says the manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone. So who is left out of the word everyone? There's no one left out. This is for you. Everyone includes you. If you read further down in verse 11, it says, now these work the same self-spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. So God is very clear in the word. He wants every person to be able to flow in the spirit. Notice this. He gives the gifts of the Spirit to everyone. So if you haven't functioned in them or flown in them or received them yet, it's mostly because you don't know how to. And if we show you how to and you extend your faith, God will work through you because it says they, he gives them to everyone. Okay, so the next thing you notice about it is this, is it is a gift. So the gifts of the Spirit are something God gives you, so you don't have to earn it. You don't have to stay in church a long time for this to happen. You, as soon as the Holy Spirit empowers you or comes on you and you're baptized in the Spirit, you are able to operate in the gifts of the Spirit immediately if you will learn how to recognize and work with the Holy Spirit. It's very, very simple. It's never hard. It's just we have to grow this dimension in our life. Have you ever, uh, uh, as a man, I remember my wife, we, we had a whole group of babies in the crash crying and and she's, oh, my one's crying. I said, really? I can hear lots of babies crying, you know. That's what I heard. I could just hear babies crying. But she could hear, that's my child crying. Because her ear was tuned in the midst of the noise to pick up the sound of someone she recognized. So there's a lot of noise that we have going on in our head and in our lives. We need to learn how to calm down and quiet down and just recognize when God is talking to you. So we want to help you with that and demonstrate that. So the gifts of the Spirit are given to everyone to profit all. So you notice here, it's not, a, uh, it's not an indication you're mature. God will give the gifts of the Spirit to any person. It does not make them spiritual. It means they're just listening and responding to God. That's all. So a person can flow in the gifts of the Spirit, but have perhaps other areas of their life are very immature. 
So it does not make you a very spiritual person being able to flow in the gifts of the Spirit or the power of God. It just means you've learned how to operate by faith in that dimension. But the rest of your life, you may have many issues and many problems. We tend to put people that can move in the gifts of the Spirit on this pedestal as though they're something special and unusual because we've got this idea that only special people will God use. We also have this wrong idea that you have to get your life together and get your act together before God can use you. I challenge you to find that anywhere in the Bible. It's just a religious concept. And if you think I've got to get my life together before God can use me, you'll spend all your life focused on trying to make your life better rather than focusing on walking with God, enjoying him, and letting him work through you. So God wants to work through everyone. And the gifts are given to profit. They're given to profit others. So when God gives you a gift, it's not for you, it's for someone else. You're the delivery board. So the gifts of the Spirit, it's like I connected, I'm connected to God, I receive something from him, and I pass it on to someone else. That's what the gifts of the Spirit are. So I'm just the channel through which this flows. I'm the gate through which God interacts with the person. So it's good for you to see that you are described in the Bible as you are a temple or a house in which God dwells. You are a gate for the supernatural to come into the earth. Any idea? So once you see that, it makes a, a huge, huge difference. Okay, now let's have a look at the different categories of gifts. It's in your notes under section 2.3. And uh, it says, notice how we look down here and uh, we read, in The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another different interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So you notice there are nine distinct operations of the Spirit there. It helps if we put them under three headings. It just gives you an idea of what they're about, and then we'll explain them more as we go through and teach about them. So here it is. First of all, there are three of the gifts, the gifts of revelation. That means God reveals to you something you didn't know. Okay? Now, if I talk to someone and they tell me, then now I've learned it from them. If I read it in a book, I've studied it and learned it. But if someone just tells me a secret, they've revealed something to me. So the gifts of the Spirit, three of the gifts of the Spirit, God just reveals something. You couldn't have worked it out. You just couldn't have known. You couldn't have known. Like, for example, I prophesied over a woman the other night and said uh, at the age of uh, between 10 and 14, she had gone through this particular crisis in her life, and this is how it affected her, and, and God was now wanting to set her free from what had happened, and, uh, and, uh, and, and we had some ministry for her. Afterwards, she told me that there were two f crises in the family, one when she was 10 and one when she was 14. There's no way I could have known that. All I'm doing is sharing what God is showing me. But for her, it was like her whole life was open up to God. Remember the woman at the well in John 4 when Jesus spoke to her? John said, uh, uh, Jesus said to her, uh, you know, asked her a little bit and interacted with her. And then he said, well, why don't you bring your husband? He said, I haven't got a husband. And he said to her, that's true. You've had five husbands and now you're living with a man. When she went away, she said, I met someone who told me everything about my whole life. Now, why did she say everything about her whole life when actually he'd only said one thing about her life? Because the impact of that supernatural revelation was to cause her to experience the uh, sensation that all of her life was suddenly open and God could see everything. So when you bring a word of knowledge uh, or move prophetically, it may not seem much to you. It's like it's very little to you because it's not for you. But when it goes to the person, oh, the person can be deeply impacted. How could you know that? That, that? It's like suddenly their whole world is open up. And so for you, it was like a little tentative step. For them, it's like, oh, this is a big deal because now you've opened up something in their life. This is so powerful to flow in the gifts of the Spirit. It's wonderful to be able to operate in them. Okay then, so <clears throat> there are three gifts. There are words of knowledge. Word of knowledge, just a little bit of knowledge about a person, some fact about their past or present. A word of wisdom is a supernatural insight about what to do or how a person needs to act or what they should do at this time. 
And discerning of spirits, we'll describe that a little later, is the ability to see right into the root of what is behind things that are happening. It enables us to see the motivations of people. It enables us to see what the Holy Spirit is doing. It also enables us to uh, discern demonic spirits. And uh, there are three gifts of utterance where something is spoken. And uh, those are the word prophecy and inspired something, words from God, diverse tongues and interpretation of tongues, where the person speaks in a tongue and someone interprets. And uh, then gifts of power when something supernatural is done. So something's revealed, something's spoken, something done. And those are faith by faith, miracles are done, the working of miracles and gifts of healing all fall under those power miracles. Okay, then, so now we have a look then. The next thing there is uh, I want you to have a look in number four. Believers can operate in all of the gifts. So every one of you is able to operate in all of the gifts. Okay? In Mark 16, verse 17 and 18, notice what Jesus said, and this is associated with the Great Commission. So it's page six in your notes, number four. I presume it's this. You've got different notes to me, have you? No, page six. Well, it's page five and seven, someone left it out. How sad. You will have to get notes on this one then. Okay then. So if you just listen, then I'll work through it with you. So Mark 16, verse 17 to 18. Now you know this verse well. Notice what it says. These signs follow those who believe. In my name they'll cast out demons. They'll speak in new tongues, take up serpents, drink anything deadly. It will not hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Now Jesus is giving the great commission. He's sending us into the harvest field. And he's sending people into cultures where the supernatural is well established. Now, in the Western cultures, often people are very dull to things of the spirit or supernatural. But in other cultures, the majority of cultures of the world, there's a high level of awareness of the supernatural realm. You go into Asia, Africa, South America, these different countries, idolatry is practiced openly. Sorcery and witchcraft are practiced openly and they have tremendous and very real power. So Jesus was sending his disciples into cultures that experienced supernatural power. And what they needed was something stronger, more powerful, to deal with and confront the demonic realm. And uh, as I say, in, in a Western culture, it's not so obvious, but in Asian cultures and, and other cultures of the world, these things are practiced very openly. You go to some villages, they all live in fear of the witch doctor and his power is real, and they live in fear of the supernatural realm, and so idolatry is practiced. Uh, in our culture, the supernatural is more hidden. It's not so out there, but it is still there. And so uh, Jesus was sending them into cultures of supernatural. He wanted them empowered spiritually to be able to do this. So notice what he said, these signs will follow those who believe. It doesn't say these signs will follow pastors. It doesn't say these signs will follow special people. It doesn't say these signs will follow just greatly anointed people. It just says these signs will follow those who believe for these signs to follow. So God wants you to be a believer. You need to believe for God to work through you. We believe God will work supernaturally. We believe he'll do it in another country. We believe he'll do it through Benny Hinn. But what we struggle with is to believe he will do it through me. And that's what he said. The signs follow believing. So we're going to inform you of the how-to. You grow the believing for it to happen and start to stretch out. You'd be quite surprised. So notice several things there. Casting out of demons, which is discerning of spirits and also the working of miracles and faith is involved in that. Speaking in new tongues and maybe interpretations. Uh, you can see that one clearly. Taking up serpents has to do with uh, wrestling with the demonic. Uh, gifts of revelation and prophecy. Drinking any deadly thing. Uh, again, supernatural miracles and laying hands on the sick, gifts of faith and healing. So Paul made some instructions there in 1 Corinthians 12. He said, it is given to everyone. The manifestation of spirit is given to everyone. So his desire was that every believer could flow in the gifts of the spirit. And that's my desire too. God wants you to, and we'll show you how to, and it'll be great for you to step out and try to. So uh, let me just give you an example of it. Uh, and that is an example of, that can easily be found is the example of Ananias. Let me just find it for you, and uh, we'll just read it for you in Acts, uh, where is it, Acts chapter 9. 
in Acts chapter 9, there's a man called Ananias. Now remember Saul had been persecuting the church, and as he was going to Damascus, he had an encounter, supernatural encounter. He was knocked off his horse, and he was struck blind, and he went and he fasted and prayed for three days. And then uh, there was a disciple in verse 10 of chapter 9, the book of Acts. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision. So notice he saw something, and in the seeing, God spoke to him. Now notice what God said to him. He said, I, he said the Lord said to him, Arise. Eh? The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, they called him by name. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And uh, the Lord said to him, Arise, go into the street called Straight. And notice, he even was told what street to go to. And then he said, And inquire in the house of Judas. He's told what house to go to, find the house that Judas owns. He said, And then there's someone in there by the name of Saul. So another word of knowledge. And he is praying. Now notice the revelation that's coming. He's being told things he couldn't know. And, he's, and, and Saul has seen in the vision a man called Ananias coming to him. So God is downloading to him words of knowledge and revelation. And then uh, he said, I want you to go to him. And he said, lay your hands on him and he'll receive a sight. Now this is a freaky thing because he knows that Saul's been murdering all the Christians. Now God's telling him, go to this place in the street inquire the guy is in there and he's blind and he's praying and I've shown him that you're going to come and you're going to pray over him. Now that takes, remember this guy's life is on the line. Can, can you understand that all moving in the spirit, there's a point where you have to take a risk. This was a big risk, wasn't it? Eh? He's having to go to the house of a murderer of Christians. That's a step of faith. He probably said goodbye to everyone before he went, just in, <laughs> just in case. you know. <laughs> and notice what he says, Ananias, I've heard a lot about this man. He does much evil to your saints. So he started to reason with God about it. And the Lord said, go, he's chosen unto me, and I will show him great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went his way, entered the house, laid his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, Jesus that appeared to you in the ways you came sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Immediately he was healed and filled with the Holy Ghost, spoken tongues. That's a great, isn't that a great story, eh? Great story. So there's an example of uh, uh, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, knowing what to do, prophetic utterance speaking over him, gifts of healing and faith flowing. That's a great, that's a great story of many of the gifts all flowing together with one man. So we see now that you are designed to be supernatural. God wants you to operate in the supernatural. Uh, he is willing to do this for you. What is your part? What is the bit you've got to, have to play? And there are some responsibilities we have concerning the gifts of the Spirit. So let me give you what they are. I'll lay them out for you, and uh, then we'll finish the session. And uh, then we'll give you something to do, give you a little activation. This will be quite an easy one as well. Everything's easy. Okay, everything will be easy, and you just got to step out and do something. It's very really simple. So let's have a look there. The gifts of the Spirit are given to everyone. So if God gives it to me, what does He expect me to do? What's my part? And there's a number of things that we're called to do. So I'm going to identify them. Now you notice I'm referring to the Bible all the time because I want you to get a base from the Word of God for how to operate in the Spirit. If you have lots of spiritual experiences without having a Word of God base, you can go all over the place. And you'll find we'll continually draw you back to the written Word of God as the judge of your spiritual experiences. Okay? So here's several things that God requires of us. Number one, He wants you to learn how to flow with the Holy Spirit. He wants you to learn it. Your responsibility is to be a learner. And learning starts tonight and goes on for the rest of your life. 1 Corinthians 12.1, concerning spiritual gifts, I don't want you to be ignorant. So God expects you to put in the effort to learn. It's, nothing comes just easily. You have to put in some effort. You have to do something. We'll show you what kinds of things you do. So he wants us to learn how to work with the Holy Spirit to build others. So here's an interesting thing. God is wanting you to be a builder of people. Many people have got the wrong paradigm, and they have very much a paradigm where you come to church and you just get blessed and minister to, and, and church is all about you having your needs met. That's only a part of the truth. Actually, the real truth is higher than that. God wants to meet your needs or bless you so you can become a blessing to others. So flowing in the Spirit is about discovering 
how to fulfill my destiny with God in the workplace, in the marketplace, wherever I am. So God expects me to learn, and learning is a lifetime thing. Secondly, we're expected to passionately desire the gifts of spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 31, earnestly, passionately, oh, long for the gifts of spirit. Why? Because when you flow in them, it, it answers all arguments. <laughs> you have a miracle, no one can argue with the miracle. I remember being in a, in a meeting, and uh, there was a lady there, and she was born deaf, and uh, I prayed for her, and both her ears opened up, and she could hear for the first time. You could just, like the whole meeting all stopped for this woman, and I watched in a moment as, first of all, there was shock because she could hear. Then there was, uh, she started to cry, and then she started to laugh, and then she was just bewildered about what was going on. It was quite extraordinary, and no one could deny that God had touched the woman. There's just no answer for it. And so in particularly spiritual cultures, people just throng to get a miracle. So when I go into Asia, they'll have meetings and they expect the power of God to flow and people just get saved. All kinds of people get saved because you can't argue with the power of God. You just can't argue with the power of God. You get deaf ears open, blind eyes open, people get healed and things happen. Oh, it's God. And people want the God who does that. In Pakistan, uh, in the meetings there that Dave was at, Pastor Dave, my son was at, uh, all kinds of miracles happening and people just flock to come in and receive Christ. Muslims coming from all over to receive Christ because they're seeing the power of God. There's something about the power of God that just stops everyone in their tracks. Uh, I, we had one guy, uh, we did the seminar here, and, and he learned how to pray for the sick. We went back to his workplace, and he was working on one of the machines here, and got, one of his friends walked by, and uh, he, was, uh, he was obviously in pain in his back. So he said, hey, what's happening? And he said, I've got a lot of pain in my back. He said, well, I've got two answers for you. One, you come to church on Sunday and we pray for you there. Or two, I pray for you now. Which will it be? And it's pretty bold to do that. And so he said, oh, okay, pray for me now. So he just left the machine for the moment, laid hands on him, began to pray. He said, how do you feel? And he said, well, it's a little bit better. Prayed again. The guy was totally healed. And everyone's watching. And so the whole of the workplace was affected because of one miracle that took place. Now, of course, they didn't all come to Christ, but that guy came to Christ. And favor came on them to start a prayer meeting in the business to pray for the business and, uh, and, and for the workers. Isn't that great? Huh? So God wants you to be passionate for this, to really yearn for it. The Bible instructs us, earnestly desire the gifts. Here's the third thing, uh, and that is in 2 Timothy 1.6, it tells us, I remind you to stir up the gifts of the Spirit uh, which is a gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. The word stir up means to kindle a fire, to get something activated and happening. So we're called to stir up the gifts. So this is completely contrary to a passive waiting around and praying for a revival or hoping that one day God will do something. This says you stir yourself up, and I'll show you exactly how to stir yourself up and what you do that gets yourself stirred up and stay stirred up so you begin to find God working through you. So stir up. The, here's another fourth thing the Bible tells us, 1 Thessalonians 5.19. Don't quench the Holy Ghost. In other words, quench means to put out a fire that God started. So it says don't quench the Holy Spirit. Control and fear in your life, they go together, they quench God working. Unbelief, oh, I don't think God could do this. That will quench God working in your life. There are things that that facilitate the Spirit of God working, and some things quench His working in your life. Reasonings in your mind will quench the flow of the Holy Spirit. Uh, negative, critical talk will grieve and quench the Holy Spirit. So we're called not to quench Him, but to learn how to cooperate with Him. And finally, the last one uh, is this. Don't neglect the gifts of the Spirit. 1 Timothy 4.14 Don't neglect the gift that's in you. In other words, don't Take it lightly. Don't just waste what God has given you. Don't despise the little beginnings that you start with. Even if you start with a little and it doesn't seem much, it can grow. It can grow till it becomes a great flow through your life. So, so those are some of the first things that we see concerning the gifts of the Spirit, that they're supernatural operations. You're designed to be a supernatural being, to connect with heaven and earth. You're designed to move and flow with the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, God wants us to have understanding how to do it. He promises he'll give the gifts to every believer, every person. He desires to work through you, and it's not about maturity. It's about faith, believing for him to do it. So you will have to extend your faith. Now, faith means something like this. I am convinced in my heart God is willing to do this. And so I will step out and start to put myself in a place where God can work through me. And always there's this threshold you've got to cross where no matter what you've been taught, you have to step out and just do something. And uh, that's the point where you start to grow and develop in the things of the Spirit. <laughs> and you'll find well, God will always come with you. He won't let you down. He'll always be there. And uh, there are many different realms that we can flow within the Spirit. There's different ways we can operate in the Spirit. Uh, you don't have to copy the way someone does it. God wants to work through you naturally and easily in a very natural way. And as I demonstrate it, you'll see it's very natural. It's not any contriving or striving or anything. It's very natural. And uh, so we're going to stop now, and I want you to do an activation. Okay? And so, well, what would that activation be? Well, again, I want it to be very simple. So the first one, who, got, who was successful at hugging someone? Anyone wants to go, okay, what was six? Great. So you all hugged someone or two people, so that wasn't that hard, was it? Eh? Had to put your arms out, just hold on. <laughs> okay, and so here's the next one I want you to do. I want you to find someone you don't know and find something that you don't know about them. Find something about them. Now, how would you go about finding something about someone that you didn't know? You will have to ask. Now, this is quite important when you're going to move in the Spirit. You'll need to start asking questions. You ask questions of the Holy Spirit, and he shows you things. Okay, so here's a good way to start. Go up and just meet someone that you don't know and find out something you didn't know about them. And we'll do that for about five minutes, okay? So you can leave your seat. Okay, we're ready for this session, and uh, welcome to the next session. Our second session, we want to talk about hearing the voice of God. Hearing the voice of God tonight. And I want to show you how you go about hearing the voice of God, how we recognize the voice of God. And uh, I want to, first of all, give you a context for it. And we're going to look in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 2. And the reason we want to focus on hearing the voice of God is because this is a major key to the supernatural being released. A major key for the supernatural being released. I want you to read with me if you've got a Bible uh, or the notes. If uh, It's an even page. It may not have it except in the ones you get tomorrow. So... This is Paul writing, so just, if it's not there, that's okay. Just focus on listening rather than searching. And uh, in Galatians 3 verse 2, Paul is writing to the Galatian church. They started off as a very vibrant Holy Ghost church, and now they had lost it altogether. And so he's writing and he's bringing adjustment to them. And one of the issues he addresses is their loss of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And one of the key reasons they'd lost the manifestation of the Spirit was legalism. They came back under laws, rules, do this and don't do that, and they lost completely the flow of the Spirit. And so he begins to challenge them, and he asks them two questions. Now, what you've got to see is when he asks these two questions, he's actually, uh, each one is to bring about an insight of where they're missing the mark. And the problem he's addressing is that they thought you become mature by obeying the laws. And what he's saying is, no, you need the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. So notice the question he asked. I want to learn this from you. I want you to tell me this. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So he asked him a question. How did you receive the Holy Ghost into your life? How did you get born again? How did you get baptized in the Spirit? How did you get a supernatural change in your life? Did you get it by working hard, or did you get it by the hearing of faith? Very simple. What is the answer? The hearing of faith. How do you get saved? You hear the word of God, and you believe and respond, and the power of God is activated by your response. Okay? That's how a person gets saved. So he appeals to the foundation of their Christian experience. How did you get saved? Did you get saved and supernaturally changed and the Spirit come into your life because you worked hard, went to church, did good things? Or 
Did you get it? Because you heard the word of God and believed, and when you responded, the Spirit of God came. The answer is really clear. It was never by the works of the law. They were supernaturally transformed when the Spirit of God came into their life. Now, he wants them to get that answer because now he's going to ask them the real question. So he asks them the first question to get their head clear. How did you start in this game? Did you start by working hard to be a better person, or did you start by believing God? Oh, believing God. Great. Now you ask the same. He's asking now the real question he wants us. So then he goes on. He said, "What well, are you so foolish? You began in the spirit, and you think you'll become mature by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain?" He said, "Now, he that supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or the hearing of faith?" So you notice he's he's asking almost the same question, but he's applying it to something else. So the first one was like this. How did you get saved? How did you get your initial experience with God? Work hard or believe God? Which was it? Believe God. Now he does, he does a different one. He does the same thing. This time he says, how does God supply the Spirit to you? How does God do miracles among you? So in other words, he's saying, how do the gifts of the Spirit flow? How do miracles happen? Work hard or hear God and respond? The answer is really clear, isn't it? Now, he's framed it up that way by appealing to how they started as a believer. They, they heard God's voice, heard God speaking to them, and, and they chose to believe and respond, and they were into a flow of the Spirit. It was supernatural. He said the moving in the Spirit's the same way. It's exactly the same way. It's not by working hard. It's not by trying hard. It's by extending your faith to believe and listen to God. So here's why if we want to move in the supernatural, we must practice hearing and identifying the voice of God. This is the significant key to operating in the Spirit. It is the hearing of faith. I extend my faith to believe God will speak to me. I extend my faith to believe God wants to use me. Now, for some of you, that may be a challenge because it's easier to believe he'll use someone else than use you. And the core challenge is, will you believe in your heart actually there's no reason at all why God would not use me. There's no reason at all why he would not want to do this. God loves me. He's justified me. I'm accepted. He wants to work through me. He's designed me to work this way. Of course I believe. And I'll extend now to listen and hear his voice. I expect to hear his voice. And, and I'm going to apply this when it comes to working with one another in the exercises. I'll get you starting to stir your faith to believe and listen and then stretch out and see what God does. That's how the activations will work. So, for example, so always it involves faith. I must extend out and believe that God will work through me. Secondly, I need to tune in to hear God speaking to me. And three, I need to step out and actually act on what God gives me. Think about how you got saved. You heard the word of God. Faith rose to believe it to be true, and then you stepped out and acted by speaking out or confessing Christ in some way. So the flowing in the Spirit actually works the same way. It all works the same way. And so we just need to practice hearing the voice of God. In John 5, 19 to 20, Jesus answered and said, I tell you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but whatever he sees the Father do, that's what he does. So he... He says the Father tells him or shows him everything he's doing. So Jesus' miracles were done by what he saw the Father doing. He just spoke out and did that. He didn't Notice he didn't heal every person. Sometimes he healed everyone. But, you know, there's a guy by the temple, the door of the temple. He walked past him every time he went into the temple and never did anything. Why was that? Because he never saw the Father healing on that day. But when Peter went by after, the, uh, after being baptized in the Spirit, Peter looked at him and he worked the miracle and the guy was healed. So was it the will of God for him to be healed? Certainly was. But there was a flow of the Spirit that Jesus listened to. So he went to one place by the, well, uh, by the Bethesda and, and the porches there and there's, uh, there's a whole heap of crippled people and one he heals. He said, why one? That's not very fair. I don't know. I don't understand all the ways God works. All we know is he saw what the Father was doing and did that. He avoided or resisted pressure to try and meet every need. He 
He learned how to listen to the Holy Spirit and work with the Holy Spirit. So we're not called to fix all problems. We're not called to solve everything. We are called to learn how to yield, extend our faith, listen to God, and obey Him. And it's in the little things you get the miracles. Let me give you an example. Uh, when I was a very young Christian, uh, uh, before I was a Christian, I was raised a Catholic. When I became a Christian and we, I stopped going to the Catholic Church and started to attend another church, a spirit-filled church, it was a great offense to my grandmother. And uh, she was deeply offended by it. And uh, we had some significant issues over that. And, and anyway, her birthday was coming. I thought, I need to get her something. And my thinking in those days was, you better make it up somehow. I thought, get her a nice gift. So I went downtown to, to and, uh, uh, and anyway, the, the day came and went, and I got so busy, I missed it. I thought, oh, no, double banger. You know, I missed it, missed the birthday, and I didn't go to church, and I'm going to hell. You know, this is not good. So I thought then, what I need to do then, I'll go, my reasoning, which is not a good reasoning, was oh, I need to buy a nice gift to make it up. Actually, that would never make it up. You just couldn't appease a thing like that. But I did want to buy a gift. Anyway, so I went to the shops and I was looking and I couldn't work out what to get. And I went past the shop. I felt the Lord Holy Spirit say, go in there. And it was a re religious shop, you know, books and things. And I went in there and, and I looked around and, and there was stuff I didn't really like there. It was full of all kinds of stuff. And I, didn't, and I thought I was, I was wrestling with God over it. And I saw a little picture there and it was the shepherd with the sheep. You know, the picture, I'm the good shepherd. And there's a picture of a lovely shepherd, and robes and Jesus. And, uh, it probably doesn't look anything like that, but that was the picture. And uh, anyway, I felt the Holy Spirit say, I want you to buy that. And I just resisted. I just really resisted. I thought, no, 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 that's, I don't even like those things. And, uh, and, and so I walked up the street, came back, and I thought, no, I can't see anything. I'll go back to the shop. So I went back and I thought, I've got nothing to lose. I feel God's telling me, I'll just get it. I'm just going to get the picture. So I bought the picture, and I bought some dried flower arrangement, and I put it all together, bundled it off with a note. Sorry, you missed your birthday. It's a little gift, and so on, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I met my grandma a little later, and, and uh, I said to her, did you get the birthday gift? She said, yes, thank you very much. I really enjoyed the, uh, the little dried flower arrangement. It was very, very pretty and smelt nice, and so on. I said, oh, good. And uh, I said, what about the, uh, what about the picture? And uh, she said, oh, she said, that did bring back some memories. And she said, when I was at school, in boarding school, at the age of 12, I really, a girlfriend of me, got into trouble with one of the teachers. And we wanted to try and put it right with the teacher. And so we decided we would buy a gift. And we bought that picture for her. Now, only God could come up with something like that. We're talking something like 60 years prior, and God knew what she did. And when she saw the picture, it triggered the memory of trying to put something right in a relationship that was wrong. And she associated with my gift a desire to put right with her something that was wrong. And now only God could come up with stuff like that, eh? So this is the, the blessing of being able to listen to the Holy Spirit on, the, on, on different situations. Okay, get any idea? So we need to hear what God is saying. All right, then. So... Um, uh, another example is found in Acts 14, verse 8 to 10. Paul is in Lystra, and a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, crippled from his mother's womb. He'd never walked, and Paul heard the man speaking. And the man heard Paul speaking, and Paul. Now notice what it says. Paul observed him intently and saw he had faith to be healed. Now that's an interesting statement. Paul fixed his eyes on the man. In other words, he stared at him. And as he stared at him, he perceived, that's in his spirit, that the man had faith to be healed. What does it look like if you've got faith to be healed? What would you be looking for? You know, what would you be looking for? He perceived. In other words, there was an inner knowing that this man had faith. He went to him and prayed, and immediately the man rose up and was healed. So this is, he saw something. So in, in, in flowing with the Holy Spirit or hearing the voice of God, we begin to hear that sometimes we see things, sometimes we'll hear things, sometimes we will just perceive or sense something in our spirit. So let's now have a look uh, as we've seen how Paul operated and we see how Jesus operated and we see that uh, it's by the uh, hearing of faith that we can work in miracles. Now we want to look at how to hear the voice of God. What does the voice of God stand, uh, sound like? 
So the first thing I want to do is to point out this, is that when you hear the voice of God, you will hear from within, not from without. God put his Holy Spirit within you. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 17 says, He that's joined to the Lord is one spirit. So that's like a husband and wife being married. So being born again, your spirit is joined to the Lord. So if you're going to hear the voice of God, you will hear him in your spirit. You won't necessarily hear him with your audible ears. You won't necessarily see anything with your natural eyes. You will have to develop your spiritual sense. Any idea? Okay, then. Now, what I want to do is I'm just going to get uh, three people up, and I want to just do a visual illustration for you to give you an idea of something. Sp I want to put something visual in front of you to help you understand something spiritual. So I won't refer to all the notes as I do it, but what I've got in the notes, I will teach it by doing a visual demonstration for you. Is that okay? Okay, so why don't we get, we get um, three guys to come up. Can we get three guys? There we are. There's one there, Brian. Two guys over here. Why don't you guys come on up on the stage? Just help me out here, okay? Help me out here. All right, then. So you don't have to do anything. You just got to stand there, okay? So here we go. So you stand there and face over here. This is perfect. Come over and stand over here and face over here, and you face over there. There we are. We have it. It's perfect. All right, then. You see everyone. Now, God has designed us, and we are body, soul, and spirit. We're a spirit man with a soul living inside a body. So your body has five senses. Uh, see, taste, touch, yet we can interact with the physical world. So with it, we have physical senses, and they will all feed into the soul. Okay, I want you to turn around this way here like this now. Put your hand on his shoulders, and you put your hand on his shoulders. That's right. So if I'm interacting with Brian and connecting with Brian, I see his physical body. And if I look into his eyes, I can see there's a person in there. But what is in there is the hidden man of the heart. And the hidden man of the heart is found here. It's the soul, the mind, will, emotions, memories, personality, and it's the spirit man. Okay, now, his spirit man, and everyone has a spirit dimension. You have a spirit being, a part of you which is spirit. Uh, the spirit man also has spiritual senses. So we just all turn around and face this way again. Okay, now, the spirit man has spiritual senses. Just stand there, that's right. So his spirit man dwelling inside him, energizes his body. Your spirit is incredibly important. The Bible says the, 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 if the body, if the spirit is absent from the body, the person's dead. So this is how important your spirit is. Your spirit energizes and gives life to your soul and your body. Your spirit is a vital part of you, but your spirit has many functions. So one function of your spirit is to energize your soul and body. Your spirit quickens your body, because if your spirit is withdrawn from your body, the body dies. So your spirit's very important. If your spirit is wounded or damaged or hurt or injured, you tend to get sick much more readily. And the Bible tells that. It says a broken spirit dries the bones. So if your spirit is uh, damaged in some way, then it will affect your body and your body's health. Uh, another aspect of your spirit is that your spirit illuminates your mind. See, it says the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, lightening up all the inner parts. So your spirit will illuminate your soul with ideas and thoughts. How many have ever had a hunch that turned out to be right? Where did the hunch come from? Oh, that sixth sense. No, it isn't. It's your spirit. The sixth sense is actually your spirit. And so when we get a hunch or an intuition, actually, there's an idea come from our spirit that's come into our mind. That's what we're picking up. And if you act on it, then you start to find things happen. So, for example, now, so we now see that we are designed to operate. We're quite unique. The soul area here is mind, will, and emotions. And so your soul retains memories, memories of various experiences. So when you have a new experience, you reference the old ones and come up with the, the conclusion. Now, for example, we'll just turn all around this way again, face all this way. Now, I went to Singapore one time, and when I went to Singapore, there was this dreadful smell. And I couldn't work out what the smell was. I, I had no reference point for it whatsoever. So I could smell, but there was no experience to attach it to 
I couldn't recognize it. It was just an unknown, horrible smell. Then someone said, oh, I said, what's that smell? They said, oh, that's durian. And they brought out this big, uh, the, the, this fruit, and it's durian, and it smelled. And some people love it, some people hate it, and mostly you can't eat it in the building. It smells everything out. Now, now, prior to that, I had no reference point. Next time I came around, oh, durian. You see, because I could smell, and the sense would then register, and the mind and memory would raise up then something, and I was aware that's what that means. That means durian. That means a fruit. I had a picture, a smell. Uh, and an experience to relate this to. And so next time around, no trouble, huh? you're in, uh, like that. Now, I just turn around and face this way again. Your spirit man will also pick up spiritual sensations, and they will go to the same place that the physical sensations went to. They go into your brain, into your memory, inside you, and your mind processes what you get. So as an, a unique person, you can receive from the physical world and recognize things from a memory bank, but you can also receive from the realm of the spirit and also build up experience so you quickly recognize different things. You quickly recognize a different kind of spirit. You quickly recognize various sorts of things. Why? Because you have developed your spiritual senses and built experience. Get the idea? Paul writes, in, uh, or the, the Hebrew writer uh, in Hebrews 5.14 says, you remain immature because you haven't exercised your spiritual senses to discern. You've got to practice to discern. Do you get it right every time? No. Why do we not get it right every time? Because our mind argues all the time. You know? and I'll talk about that in a moment. Okay then, so if you just put your hand on the shoulder now, and your hand on the shoulder over here. All right, that's right. Now, so when you are born again, the Holy Spirit comes in and becomes joined one spirit with the Lord. So we see in 1 Corinthians six seventeen, very clearly, he that's joined to the Lord is one spirit. That's how close you are to him all the time. So everywhere you go, you carry the presence of God. And God knows all things. So in your spirit, you know a lot. And you have access to the source of lots of things all the time. All the time. He's he never going to leave you. He's never going to turn away from you. You have access all the time to the presence of God. All the time. How do you get in tune with that access? You've got to silence all the noise that goes on in your head and tune in to your spirit. So now, how am I going to hear the voice of God? Well, the first thing it's helpful to think of is where am I going to hear him? The first thing to recognize is you're not going to hear him out here saying, Hello, this is God. You, you're not going to get that. And it just all turned face this way. So if you go looking for signs and, and fleeces and all that kind of stuff, you're acting immaturely. That's not where we're to be looking for God outside us. It's, it's not where he's to be found. He's to be found inside you. So if you're going to grow in the things of the Spirit, you have to develop what's inside you. In the idea? So you find many immature Christians are constantly looking for something outside of them. They look for something shaking or moving or this or that or a feeling or anything, but they're looking in the wrong place because the devil can manipulate circumstances and manipulate everything around you. He can make storms happen. He can do all kinds of things. So we don't look outside ourselves. We look to our spirit man because that spirit man is joined to the Holy Spirit and therefore has access to heaven. Put your hands all on one another like that. Okay, now, here we go. So, the physical man accesses the physical world, but through my spirit, I can access the realm of heaven all the time. Free to access the presence of God. I just got to learn how that happens. Okay, so turn around now. We're going to show you how it happens. Turn around. Put your arms on one shoulder like that. Okay, so if God is wanting to communicate to me, how will he do it? Very simply, the Holy Spirit will communicate with my spirit. How does he do it? Usually one of three ways. Now he can do it many ways, but there's usually one of three ways that there's direct spirit-to-spirit -spirit communication. Here it is. Number one, you see something. Now you don't see it with your natural eyes. The Holy Spirit puts a picture into your spirit. And that picture in your spirit rises up 
into your mind. Or the Holy Spirit will speak a word into your spirit. And that word will rise up in your mind. Or the Holy Spirit will just put an impression. You don't know how you know, but you just somehow know something. If I say, how do you, do you know you're saved? You say, yes, of course I know I'm saved. How do you know? I don't know, I just know. Well, the Bible tells me, but I know, I know. You know because there's an inward knowing. How do you inward know? The inward knowing is the witness of the Holy Spirit with your spirit, you're a child of God. It's an inner knowing. That's how you know you're saved. Okay, so the Holy Spirit will do this. Now, so if I'm going to be tuning into the voice of God, here's the first thing. The first thing is I have to quiet the noise. You have got noise all the time in your head. That's why I hate having headphones on. Just noise in the head. Some people love it, and I don't mind listening to a certain amount of music, but I don't want my head to be full of noise of something else. So what kind of noise is in your head? All kinds of memories, all kinds of pictures, all kinds of experiences, things that have happened, things that all kinds of things in there. You have demonic voices talking to you. They fill your mind with accusation, condemnation, not good enough. Who do you think you are? All that kind of stuff is noise. And the noise is a block to hearing God. So if I'm going to hear God, I need to, number one, know I'm going to hear him from my spirit, so I should activate my spirit by prayer, praying in tongues. Secondly, I need to quiet my soul so that my mind is not busy and all over the place. And thirdly, I need to tune in to what will be spontaneous. Now, the language of your heart is different to the language of your head. The language of your head is logical, structured, line upon line, and it's thought through carefully. That's how the language of the mind works. It's logic. So, for example, if you're working out some mathematics, you're logical. One, two, three, four. You're trying to work out where to put something. One, two, three, four. You're trying to create something. Now, it's intuitive, and you start to flow. So, in our, the way we're designed is like this. An amazing design God has given to us. We're designed to be supernatural. It's amazing. Your brain is divided in two hemispheres or two parts. With the left side, it's the logic side. So if we got him doing some maths, and suppose he can, can you do maths or something? Okay, suppose he can do maths. So he's trying to figure something out, and we put a brain scan on him and try to find out what part of his brain is busy, all the left side will be busy. If he's dreaming and imagining, or creating, it'll be the right side of his brain. So you're designed so that one part of you is logical and process-oriented, one, two, three, four, blah, blah, blah. Like that. The other part of you is intuitive. It gets ideas, it's flashes and ideas and things like that, and it's creative. So if you're a creative person, you'll be very active in this part. If you're a logical person, you'll be very active in that part of your brain. But both sides exist for every person. And now, when the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, what happens is he imparts into our spirit, and which side of the brain do you reckon it comes up into? It comes up onto the right. So what do you get? You just get spontaneous thought. You get a, a, a picture just pops into your mind. Or you get a word just suddenly comes into your mind. So what happens immediately after that comes in? The other part of your brain takes over and starts to argue it down and dismiss it. And men are often quite bad at that, and their wife are often quite intuitive. So some of you may recognize, and we won't ask for any show of hands, of a decision-making process where the husband felt this was the right thing to do, and his wife said, I don't know, I don't, I don't feel very happy about that. And she said, well, why not? It's logical, it all works out. And she said, no, no, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. I said, well, I can't work with that, you know, that's all, that's just unreasonable. You're right, it is unreasonable, it's intuitive. And then later on, you go ahead and do it, and then you find actually it was the wrong thing to do. Because your wife had this intuitive impression, and it was of greater value in discerning what something was than your mind was. I'll give you another example. How many of you have met someone, and they look good, sounded good, but you just felt something's not right about this person? 
that, something's creepy. See, it's kind of language a woman would be, it's creepy. You know, I don't like that guy. You know, I don't like him. You know, they say, I don't like him. And the man may say, well, what's wrong? There's nothing wrong with him. He's, you know, he can't figure it out. But, but she's operating, he's operating out of logic, what he can see, what he can hear, and he's working on a reasoning basis. She's picking up intuitively from his spirit, there's something not right about this personal situation. I don't feel right about it. Now, you think about this. In Colossians 3.15 it says, let the peace of God be the umpire of your heart. So if you feel troubled and no peace in your spirit, then no matter what it looks like, you know it's going to be a problem. Now, you don't initially know that, but you find that after you've had a number of experiences where you overruled your spirit, did something, and then it didn't work out too good. You learn then, actually listen to the voice of your heart more carefully. Now, we do need to work things out. We've got a capacity to do that. We should develop our mind and intelligence, but we need to also develop the intuitive side of us. So, so when God speaks to us, it's very simple. I just calm down and quiet my soul to listen. I stir up my spirit through praying and focusing on the Lord. And as he speaks, spontaneous thoughts, pictures, or impressions come into my soul, and I pick them up as an impression. Now, you don't just do away with your brain and shoot your brain. You actually then inquire. So, for example, if... If I, uh, I'll give you an example of someone. I was talking to one person, and I had a word of knowledge. They were extremely lonely. And so I said, I just feel the impression that actually you're struggling with a lot of loneliness. No, 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 I'm not lonely. Uh, it came again, so I said it again. No, 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 I'm not lonely. Now, that's two denials. But it came again. And so I said in the end, I actually feel you're quite lonely. I feel God's laying on my heart. You're struggling with relationships and friendships, and you'll only got out of me a little more. She broke down and began to weep. So I was right the first time, but the person tried to pretend that wasn't so. And just the impression kept coming and coming and coming. So remember, it was just an impression that came that I couldn't shake off. And so when I gave voice to it, then God was able to move. So the impressions that you get, your mind will always argue them. Your mind will act like, that can't be so. That couldn't be true. Like you see a person smiling, and God says they've got grief in their heart. And you look at them and you think, no, sorry, got that one wrong. And <laughs> you see your mind tries to reason the flow of the spirit. So we need to learn how to train our mind to ask the right questions. So my spirit can receive information from the Holy Spirit that my mind would never know. The role of your natural mind then is to inquire, Holy Spirit, what does that mean? How do I work with that? What do you want me to do about that? So you inquire of God rather than reason it all away. So there it is. It's not so quite so difficult. So why is it some people have trouble hearing the voice of God? Now, the trouble that people have with hearing the voice of God falls it seems to me, into two categories. It falls firstly into the people who are like Dr. Spock on Star Trek. They are totally head, and they just reason everything, everything structured. Usually with a person like that, there's strong spirits sit around their mind, and they're disconnected from their heart. And often there's issues being in their life that have disconnected them. They many times need healing or deliverance or setting free or training in how to engage with their heart because they've lived out of their head and logic all their life and they haven't developed their spiritual side. So very often the spirits of rationalism and unbelief, rejection and strife, all kinds of things sit around that person. But they can be set free and they can develop the capacity of tuning into spontaneity, to spontaneous ideas, to thoughts, to feelings, to impressions and learning to recognize and identify and name them. The other extreme is where you get someone who's often quite broken relationally and everything is God. God told me this. God told me that. God told me this. Now, it's like there's this, this flow of everything God told them. Now, when you hear that, you know that two, three things. Number one, God isn't saying all those things. Number two, that they're very broken people. And three, they've got major problems relationally. And so they're putting it all out there of God to portray some spiritual hotline 
reality is we don't hear God talking all the time that clearly. We have impressions and we learn to be led by God gives you wisdom to run your life without him having to tell you what to do. He doesn't tell you what to do on your shopping list. It's your job to figure that one out. He doesn't tell you what color you should paint something. He gives you room to be creative. He doesn't tell us everything to do in our life or we're like a puppet being told what to do. He actually works with us in a relationship where we work with him. He's the senior partner and he guides us, but he gives us room to participate in life. So you've got to learn to find the things that you yourself have and own them rather than say it's all God. So when I hear people saying, God told me this, God told me that, I know, one, God isn't telling them all those things. Two, there's just a big show and I'm not meeting the real person. Three, there's brokenness inside. They really need help. A person like that usually is unstructured in their life and create havoc in a church where you're trying to flow and develop things in the spirit. You have to actually bring them into a discipline where they have to learn to structure their life and stop just listening to every impression that comes because they've got turmoil in the soul and haven't learned to filter out what's God and what isn't. So both extremes happen, but none of you are in that extreme. You are all here in that happy group who will just be open up to listen to God. That would be wonderful. Okay then, so again, just summarizing it again. When God speaks, he speaks into our spirit, the idea, and it'll come up as an impression which comes into your mind, and then you just focus on that and then begin to speak and act on what God gives you. And as you speak and act on it, then the Spirit of God moves. And that's when people get touched. Okay? Well, let's give them a clap and thank them for helping out. Good stuff. Thank you. Okay. So you're getting an idea now about how all of this works. Because this is, I want you to understand it clearly. And uh, <laughs> we'll see. Now, I want to just give you two or three examples out of the Bible just to support what I've been saying. And then we'll get you to do an activation. How about that? Well, there was a lot of enthusiasm there. That's right. <laughs> okay, so again, this is not in your notes today, but it will be there tomorrow. And uh, so let me just give you a few examples. So you might want to just jot them down if you, if you wish to. But let me just give them. The first one is found in Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1. And he said, I will stand on my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what the Lord will say to me. Notice his words, I will watch to see what God will say. So he did a couple of things. Number one, he positioned himself to be quiet. This is important to hearing the voice of God. You've got to quiet yourself down. So when I get to do activations with you, we'll get you to do a couple of things. One of the things we'll get you to do is to pray in tongues so your spirit becomes energized alive with the flow of the Holy Spirit. Second thing we'll get you to do is just be quiet and focus your attention to just listen for a flow of spontaneous thoughts that come. And then the third thing is we'll get you to then identify what you're thinking or feeling or what's happening and speak it out. Okay, so, so Habakkuk positioned himself to hear God, quietened himself, and then he focused on intuitive flow of seeing, hearing. That's how he got it. And he was able to discern it. God spoke to him by a picture. In 1 Samuel 3.10, you remember the story of Samuel? And Samuel was lying down, and the Lord came and spoke to him, said, Samuel, Samuel, and he jumped up and ran to Eli. Why did he jump up and run to Eli? Very simply, he heard something so strongly, he thought it was Eli. He didn't recognize that it was God's voice. So it takes time to recognize the voice of God speaking to you. You've got to practice till you get used to, oh, that is the voice of God. I'm recognizing him speaking to me. I know that's God speaking. And there are a number of ways we can, we can get that. A third, third example there is in Mark 2, verse 8. It says, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were reasoning. He perceived in his spirit they were reasoning. So it was he, he knew something. Now, what was going on? I'll get the picture. Jesus is speaking. And get this. He worked out what they were thinking. How did he figure out what they were thinking? He felt it in his spirit, what they were thinking. Now, 
you've probably had an experience like that where you were talking with someone or, uh, and then suddenly, or, or they were talking, and suddenly you felt something about that person. A thought rose up. It, you just perceive it in your spirit. You can't shake it off. You just know you can feel it's there. So the, the third example is the one we saw with Acts 14.9 where Paul looked at the man intently and saw he had faith to be healed. How did he see it? He perceived it in his spirit. There was a knowing inside. So you'll discover then that all of the moving in the spirit, moving in the supernatural, comes out of intimacy or connection with the Holy Spirit where we learn to recognize his voice and act on it. And the more you act on it, the easier it is to recognize. The more you practice walking with God and listening to and responding to his impressions, the more easily it comes to you. It's like Jesus said, if you have ears to hear, more will be given. If you don't have ears to hear, even the little you have, you lose. So it's like you have to use it or lose it. You've got to continually develop listening to God in your personal private life. So it kind of flows out of devotions. Okay then, so well, just the last thing I'll finish this session with and then we'll get you to do something. Uh, there are other ways that people receive revelation, of course, but what I want to show is just some things about the revelations God gives. There are a couple of checks that you want to run by anything that you think God has given you. here, And here's what they are. Number one, so these are tests of revelation. If you think you got something from God, uh, you'd find this on page 19 in your notes. Number one, does it agree with the Bible? If it doesn't agree with the written word of God, the Holy Spirit wrote the written word of God, will he who wrote that Bible tell you something different to what he wrote? Not going to happen. So if you come up with a revelation and you say that God has spoken to you this thing, but it's contrary to what the written word of God says, you got it wrong. You've actually just got it wrong, and it's come either just as a random thought, it's come out of your own desires or thoughts, uh, and perhaps that's how you got it, but you got it wrong. If it disagrees with the Bible, that didn't come from God. You've got to have the Bible as your standard for testing all revelation. So, you know, if you find that you've got something and you think God's told you to do this, and you find it's completely opposite to what the Word of God says, you, you got it wrong. And if you keep getting it wrong, you should go and get some counsel to sort out that something's going on inside you. Any idea? But, uh, so if people come to you and say, God told me to do this, and it's very clear, God, you know, God told me it was okay, we're in love, we can sleep together, you know, hello, give me a break. It's, you're not married, you know? God, the Bible says those that commit fornication, shan't inherit the kingdom of God. So he's not going to tell you that it's going to go good for you personally if he's told you in the written word something different. So you use the Bible. You've got to become familiar with the Bible. Load yourself a read the Bible, get familiar with the Bible, and automatically you'll be filled with thoughts of God that are useful in ministering to people. Very helpful. Okay. Second thing is, does it line up with the character of God? Is that something like, that God would likely to do. You know, like the devil took Jesus up into a high mountain and said, come on, the word of God says, you know, cast yourself down, his angels will take care of you. You want to jump. In other words, or put it another way, he was standing on a high place. He said, go on, jump. It'll be okay. You'll just float to the ground. And you see, this is contrary. It may have been what the word said, but actually it was a misrepresentation of the nature of God. So God... Interesting thing, God seldom takes someone and suddenly moves them from here up to some big thing. God grows you step by step. So it's not the nature of God to want you to suddenly show yourself off in some big way, a public, public exhibition, or to make a big, uh, big scene of any kind, or to do something spectacular. He just grows you little by little by little. So if it doesn't seem like it's the nature of God, it probably isn't. And then finally, does it produce, or two other things, does it produce good fruit? So one way of testing revelation is if the, if, if the fruit of it is good. That's why we'll teach you to ask after you've prayed or ministered to someone, hey, how did that go? You know, did, what's your, what did you sense as a result of me sharing with you these things? In other words, just get a bit of feedback. And the person says, well, that was great, man. It really helped me and touched me. But you get feedback. If there's fruit from God, uh, it's always good. Fruit from heaven is gentle and reasonable, open to reason. 
For example, you get someone who says, well, just God told me, and, and you can't reason with them. That is definitely not God. Because the Bible says in James, the wisdom that comes from heaven is quite easily entreated. You can appeal and talk and interact. And so we'll teach you when it comes to ministering a word from God that just do it gently. Don't say, well, God told me, like you're the authority in the air. Just, hey, listen, I just sensed this, or I just felt this, or I had an impression, maybe God, about this. In other words, just do it much more low-key. It'll it'll, it's easier for you to interact with the person, easier for them to receive as well, not so dogmatic. <laughs> okay. And the final one is, if it comes from God, it will bear witness with your spirit. When something is right, your own spirit bears witness to it. How many of you have had someone tell you something? Like I had someone, I taught Michelle what to do, but Michelle had some guy come up to her and said, oh, God's told me uh, uh, that uh, I'm going to marry you. Now, what does she feel straight away? Now, this is the dilemma when some guy carries on like that. A good Christian girl wants to please the Lord. Now he's saying, God's told me this thing. She doesn't feel it in her heart, but she wants to please God. You throw people into turmoil with that kind of stuff. It's very manipulative. I said to her, tell him just straight, God didn't tell me that, so goodbye. <laughs> you know? In other words, own your own life. She's, I said, he can think what he thinks, and he can say what he says, but actually, if it doesn't witness with your spirit, don't go with it. And I've seen many people trapped into relationships, into business deals. If they listen to their spirit, they'd have never been happy about it. But they kind of got impressed that someone was very prophetic or very spiritual. How do they get impressed? Because they projected it out that they were. But the wisdom from God is easily entreated. It's gentle and pure, pure and it produces good fruit. One of the things that will witness with your spirit. So if something doesn't register as being right, then just say, well, thank you very much, but no thanks. I'm not going to go with that. You can thank the person. We can be polite and have to be rude, but we don't need to receive things that aren't right. So let your own spirit bear witness with that whether this bears witness and good fruit or not. Are we okay now? Why don't we just stop now and uh, we'll get you to stand up and turn around and sit down and then we're going to give you an activation. Okay then. All right then. Now what I want to do in this, uh, in this session, uh, first of all, I want to get you to all to do an activation. I'll just show you what it is in just a moment and then I'll introduce you to activations and how they work. And then after that, we're going to talk about how to activate the gifts of the Spirit in your life. So I'll do the teaching session, how to activate the gifts, after we've actually got you to step out and have a try. So we'll get started first of all, and then we'll talk about the specific things, then we'll have a chance for some questions, and hopefully just finish around about 9.30. And uh, so I want to just do a simple activation. Now this is a very, very simple one. And in this one here, what we want to do is want to just pray an inspired prayer. So I could choose, hey, Henry, do right? just come on up here, please? Can I just practice on you? There we go. So Henrietta comes up. There we go. And so this is the kind of process. Now, with all of these activations, the thing to remember is now we're just practicing. Practicing means we're stepping out to have a turn. We're getting on the bike to see if we can ride it. And even if we wobble, eventually we'll get going and we'll be riding the bike. So we're just having a practice. So the first thing I like you to do in any activation is just ask them a smile. Hey, can I practice on you? Great. That's right, and so you get a very positive response. Yeah, great, go, do it. Great job, you know, I want. See, because hunger and expectancy from a person can draw from you, can help you when you're learning how to flow with the Spirit. Okay? Always remember this, that God wants to speak to them and bless them and help them because he loves them. So it's not about you. It's actually about God being loving and the person needing to be touched by God. It's not about you at all. You're just actually the channel through which it happens. So what we're going to do, I could ask her something like, well, what would you like me to pray for? And ask what her need is and get her to tell me her need. That's one way we could pray. You're used to doing that. Well, what's your need? and something like that. Or what I could do is just ask the Lord to drop into my heart a simple thought that will be the basis of what I will pray. And it could be a picture could be a word, could be just an impression to pray about a certain area. Okay? So I need to do. So the steps that we'll take is number one, we just say, hey, can I practice on you? Yeah, very positive response. That's great. All right. Now, I may like to take the person's hand, just make a connection with them. So the first thing that was helpful to do is just if you 
begin to exercise or stir up your spirit. The key in this, remember, is listening. Just listening to your heart. So I'm going to break it down very, very slowly, uh, because if I do it slowly, then you can see what's going on inside me. I'll explain it, and then you'll see me doing it, okay? So I'll try and pull it apart for you. So the first thing I would do is just, at this stage, I'll just begin to pray in tongues. As I'm praying in tongues, my inner man is starting to come alive, so I become stirred up. I become aware of God. See, because when you pray in the Spirit, your spirit comes alive. Your spirit is praying. Your spirit is being built. So if I was to just, so I need to now close off my mind to busyness. I've got to stop thinking you're all looking at me and what if I get it wrong stuff, you know, all that sort of stuff. The what ifs. You've got to shut down what if messages in your head. They stop you receiving God. And the way to shut them down is to just redirect your focus. If I focus on myself, now I'll start to fill with fear and my spirit will close and now I'm not going to get anything because I need to get it from my spirit. But if my spirit's closed because of fear, I get nothing. So I need to stay relaxed. And the best way to stay relaxed is not to focus on me, but to focus on how much God loves this person. So I just begin to meditate on how much God just loves her, how important she is. I'm sure that God who loves her really does want to talk with her. So I just keep my attention fixed, and I'm expecting God to give me something. Okay? So ask for permission, calm yourself down, stir up your spirit, man, with expectation. Then begin to reach out for God to give you something. And you're looking for a spontaneous word or thought or impression, and then you're going to turn that into a simple prayer. So you have to start at some point. So right now I'm still trying to get something. <laughs> but it's okay because I'm very aware and I totally believe God knows all about her. God knows exactly what she needs right now. I'm convinced God wants to do this. I just have to relax and wait on him. Now I'm slowing the whole process down so you can see it taking place. Eh? And then in a moment, I'll just get an impression will just come. And just as I was talking, an impression came just then. One word just dropped into my mind. I'm talking to you. Suddenly a word just drops into my mind like that. And so, because I, and so that word is a seed. When God gives you something, he only gives you the seed. You have to actually step out with what you've got and start the journey Trusting God that as you share what you've got, that he will give you more and a flow of the Spirit will take place. That's the risky bit, isn't it, eh? That's the bit. But if you've got nothing to lose, only a practice. So I can focus, instead of worrying about whether I pass, fail, I can just focus on being kind and praying for her. See? So now, because I've got a word, God expects me to use a measure of intelligence. He doesn't want me to be a puppet. So therefore he expects me now, having given me an insight what to pray for, that I would pray with some sense about that. So I'll have to start praying. Just well, just I'll pray generally, and then you'll then I'll start to pray about what God has given me. Okay? So I've just got to start, you know? So you start to say something. You've just got to start a flow. And as you start the flow and remain just fixed on the Lord, something he'll you'll get the words will start to come. All right then. So I have in the moment just one word, so I'll just put my attention on that word. And, and I can just, I'm starting to feel things now. So I'm just going to pray for her. I could prophesy this, but I'll actually just turn it into prayer because I want it to be really simple because every one of us can pray. And most of you ask people if, they'll, if you can pray for them, they'll say yes. Okay, so here we go. Father, I just thank you for Henrietta. That's a good way to just get started. It's quite easy to start the flow. Something simple like that. And then I'll start to move to what I felt God give me. And as, I, as I, I stay focused on that and relax and let my heart flow to her, there'll be a language just come forth. And don't try and work it out in the head. Just let my heart flow to her. All right then, so just again, just focus. I can see the word again. Father, I just thank you for Henrietta. I thank you, Lord, you love her. 
and that, Lord, you will never leave her to be on her own and alone. Lord, I ask that you would just touch her in the depths of her being and heal the loneliness that she's been experiencing and feeling for some time. Pray, Lord, she'll feel your presence loving her, comforting her, and reassuring her that you are always with her. Lord, let your presence and love just flow over her right now in Jesus' name. Oops, I have to hold on to you. He'll be going over. All right then. Now, can anyone work out what the word was that the Lord gave me? Loneliness. Okay. So you see how I just started generally. And, and as I began to meditate in that word, I could just feel all this grief around her. Grief of loneliness. And, and, and that's been something around her life. And God is wanting to heal the loneliness and just to have her reassured he's there. Yeah. <laughs> what are you feeling? Well, just tell us what you're experiencing just as a result of doing this. <laughs> okay. Uh, just take, it, take your time. It's okay. It's all right to cry because God is touching her in a real area of her life. What did you feel or sense? Um, that God is with me. Right. And that's what I need. You needed to know tonight God is with you. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Has there been loneliness or struggle, that sense of being on your own? There's been a sense of it. And in it, though, I have, I'm aware that he's there. I just need more of an awareness of that. Right. And a deeper, greater level of knowledge. You need a deeper, greater level of that he, that uh, he is there. All right, then. Okay, then. Well, then why don't we just help you with that now, Peter? You're ready to catch her in a moment. And uh, because I could feel the Spirit of God coming on you. I want you. As you close your eyes, yeah. I want you just to let, just use your imagination to see that Jesus <coughs> is just there right in front of you. He's there with you right now. And his presence is going to come and just touch you just in a moment. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. You <coughs> just coming on her life right now. Your presence just touching her. Lord, just fill her with love. Let your peace just come on her now. Whew. Receive. There it is, very simply. Whoa. Wonderful presence of God just over her. You just enjoy the Lord. So when we move this way, people start to experience God. Isn't it nice to feel him, isn't it, eh? Yeah. <laughs> isn't it nice to feel <laughs> That's why we come along. We, yeah. Doesn't matter about all the teaching, we just want to feel God. <laughs> Okay then, so, so I pulled it apart and kind of broke it down into bit by bit by bit so you can sort of see it. But actually when you work and operate, it's all together like that. And it's just relaxed and natural. So the biggest problem in flowing in the Spirit is becoming focused on yourself and on yourself failing. If your mind goes there, I can tell you now, your spirit will close and it's very difficult to function. So part of the discipline is to realize the gifts of the Spirit are given to us to profit others. So if your attention is on the giver and the other and away from yourself, the flow takes place more easily. So here's what we will do. We'll get you all to pair up with someone you don't know that well. Take their hand and say, and smile, can I practice on you? And they will say, yes. Yes. Do your best. <laughs> Make it very positive, encouraging experience. Okay? And then what we'll do is we'll just pray in tongues quietly together and then go quiet and you just focus and you're just waiting to receive something. An idea, a thought, a picture, an impression. No big thing, just something simple. And then when you've got that something, just focus on it and then launch out and start praying for the person around what God has shown you. All right? I'll just do it one more time. Come on, Brian. Come on up. Can I practice on you, Brian? Awesome. That's fantastic. Great. Hey, let me take your hand then. So again, I just begin to reach out and begin to start to focus on the Lord. Let my attention be set on him. Begin to pray in tongues and become conscious of the presence of God. And I'm looking for something. And immediately a word came to me. Just like that. Just a word just dropped into my mind. So now that I know that a word's come, 
Now, how do I use that? What does God want me to, to do with that? So I'll start generally, and as I start talking, just relax and lead into what God gave me, expecting it to grow and get more. Father, I thank you for Brian. I thank you love him, and your hand is upon his life. That's the general bit, eh? just getting started. Eh? <laughs> Father, I just thank you love him. I thank you your presence is with him. And Father, I just pray for an increase in confidence in his life. Confidence in hearing your voice, confidence in flowing with you. I pray, Lord, in his walk with you, he will greatly grow in his ability to hear your voice, grow in the confidence uh, of your power and presence with him. That, Lord, he will become bold in moving and ministering in the things of the Spirit. Father, let that boldness and confidence just begin to come over his life right now. In Jesus' mighty name, touch him, Lord. There it is, the presence of God just coming on him now. Oh, <laughs> so, because once you speak, the presence of God comes upon your your speaking. It says the Spirit of God brooded over creation. Then, when the Word came, then the Spirit of God began to move. So, you've got to learn to speak with confidence. So, Father, just thank you for Him right now. Just lift your hands up to the Lord, and you know, the power of God is here tonight. The power of God touches life right now, and there it is. And, all right then. So we can teach you how to do that too. <laughs> Tomorrow. 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 All of these things can be learned. I would not have you be ignorant or just not know. God's plan is that we know what to do. And we'll help you over these two days, night and tomorrow, how to do it. But I need you just to step out and have a practice. Now, whether you get it right or wrong is not important at all. There's no right and wrong or worrying about it. What I want you to do is have the experience of reaching out to pray and minister to someone and you're leaning on listening to God to get what to say. He will only give you a bit of it and you've got to actually take the step and put some language with what you've got. So what was the word that God gave me? Confidence. And so what is it about that? Did he lack it? Did he need it? What it? That's what I was asking God. Well, he lacked it and he needed it and God wanted to grow him in confidence. What area around the operations of the Spirit? Okay? So how was that for you? Is that okay? It was right on. Hasn't that good, eh? Thank you, Jesus. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> like I say, we're all practicing. <laughs> so there's no pass fail in this. There's just try, try, and try again. And we all practice. So remember, the first most important thing is to say, can I practice on you? And we do want a smiley face. You know, <laughs> yeah, come on, encourage me. Oh, do the best. And then we'll pray together. I'll lead you through it step by step. And then you go for it. Okay, we're ready? So let's get someone ready to go. Come on, get someone to practice on. You got someone to practice on? If you haven't got someone to practice on, raise your hand and then look for someone who's got their hand raised. Down there, two people. Okay, we all ready? Uh, okay then. All right, now I want you all just to listen and walk with me step by step, okay? So the first thing is, smile at the person and say this, do you mind if I practice on you? And give a nice smiley response. Okay. Anyone missing someone to pray for them? You can pray. Hmm? You can go in three so you can pray for me. <laughs> That'll be great. I'll come down. Okay then. So we're ready. Everyone's asked if you can practice. All right, now take their hand, just make the personal contact, take their hand, and then when you've taken their hand, then we close our eyes and begin to just pray in the Spirit. Pray in tongues or pray whatever way you're able to. Set your attention towards the Lord. Keep your eyes open so you can see if you want. Okay, praying in tongues. Yeah, you pray for me. So what you do is you then 
Focus your attention on the Lord. He loves this person so much. He just loves them. They're very precious to him. He wants to give you something. Make you aware of a need so, or something to pray for. So listen now, expecting him to give you something. A word, a picture, just a thought, an impression. Something just, don't try and work it out. What does this person need? Just God, you speak to me. As soon as you get something, lock on it. Just focus on it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And then when you're ready, just one person starts out first. And a short prayer, no big long prayers. Just use what God gave you to pray a simple short prayer. Then change over. Okay. And I just pray that you'll bless him mightily, that you'll continue to work through him, Lord, and show him new ways and revelations of how he can strengthen the church and the Lord, how he can strengthen all of us in you, Lord, and that you may um, that you may empower him and, and enable him in his ministry, Lord, to do even greater work than he has ever done before, that you, Lord, will be glorified through him. Mm. And Lord, we just pray that you'll um, continue to strengthen him in the Lord, Lord, and through that he can strengthen us, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Wonderful. Very good. Okay, well, I got with the internet the Lord. That's not right. Gosh, that's new. Okay. But that's all, it's all you needed to do. It's just you take what you feel, and that's, then it will start to work with that. And did you notice once you started, it started to flow? Yeah, so just relax. You don't have to be so fast. You can just relax in it all and feel the flow. Okay? Now, my mind needs to go fast, I know. Fast, yeah, fast, yeah. Fast. Okay, and then you speak past. Okay, well, if you just just you just keep your mind relaxed and centered on him, and you'll get the flow quite easily. Well, that was good. That was good. Thank you very much. Now let me pray for you. Can I practice on you? Okay, you want to watch them. <laughs> good, good, good. Okay, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I'm praying in tongues. <laughs> You're brilliant. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for my sister. I thank you, Lord, for her humility and her desire and hunger to learn. And you see her heart and you know the desire she has to be effective for you. I pray, Lord, you would unusually gift her with revelation so she would accurately and precisely get insights and words of knowledge about people and words of encouragement to pray for them. Father, I release your presence around her life to do this in Jesus' name. Oh my gosh. Amen. Thank you. Wonderful. Bless you. Okay. Yeah, sometimes that happens. Maybe an extra one tonight or tomorrow. Okay. Have you all had a turn now? All practiced? Ask the person, how did that feel to you? Get some feedback how it went. How did it go? It was good. All right. Excellent. That's okay. You did well. Well done. Wonderful. Well, it was? Yes. It was? Very good. Isn't that good? Can I tell him the words? Yes. It was love. Wow, good. I don't know what the reason was, but... Very good. I'm just touched by yes. it all. Yes. Quite emotional. Yes. That's, it's, well, you're feeling the presence of God touching you, and we feel it's not in the head, it's in your heart. You'll feel His love. And, and so when you feel that, you begin to start to weep. It's not uncommon for people when they start to feel God to start to weep. And they don't know why they're weeping. There can be many reasons, just because we feel loved. And most people go through life struggling to be loved, and to be good enough to be loved. And when it suddenly comes without anything, 
it's just undeserved and just given, it actually can just cause you just to weep and weep and weep and not know, not be able to stop, not know why. So don't try and work it out in your head. Just enjoy that you're feeling God touching you. Yeah? I've prayed for the last 18 months, because I'm a new Christian, I've prayed for the last 18 months to feel and hear the voice of God, and it's been in my head. And here you are. How wonderful. Why don't you come over here? Let me just pray for you. Okay, just stand behind her. That's right. I want you just to close your eyes. And as I pray for you, you will start to feel the presence of God come on you. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for my sister's love for you and her desire for you. Lord, let heaven open over her tonight and day after day in this next season ahead. Let her begin to feel the presence of your wonderful love. Touch her, Lord, right now in Jesus' name. Fill her with that love in Jesus' mighty name. Let it overwhelm her. And I feel the Lord showing me that growing up, you had to work so hard to be good enough. It was like it was a constant struggle ever to be good enough. And I see words being spoken over you. And the words seem to be, no matter how hard you tried, the words were so critical of you. It's like someone's finding fault in every little thing. And it was heartbreaking because no matter how hard you tried, it was just as though I'm never going to be good enough. And you've struggled and wrestled with this for years. And so the way you've worked to deal with that is by serving people and doing things for people. But no matter how much you've done, it feels like it's still never enough. And God wants you to know he loves you. He loves you. He embraces you and celebrates you. He cares about you. Amen. There you go. Gosh, you are so right. <laughs> now I know it's God. Yes. See? It's incredible. Yeah. This is what, this is actually word of knowledge and then prophetic word flowing together. So God showed me the pictures and I could see you as a younger girl and someone going like this and speaking words and how difficult and painful it was. And then as you've grown, I could see how you've struggled in this area. And God wants you to have it freely that he loves you. I'm so glad you came. <laughs> okay, let's just draw everyone in. All right then. So if we could just uh, get you all just to be seated again. Just get out of the camera line. Great. Okay then. Now, how many experienced that the prayer that was prayed for you was just so right for you? It was just the right thing. How many had that experience? Whoa, look at all those hands. Come on, let's give you all a clap. That's really wonderful. Okay. How many felt emotions as the person prayed for you? It really touched your heart. How many felt that? Whoa, look at all those hands. Come on. This is fantastic. <laughs> wonderful. Okay then. So how many, when you stepped out to pray, you were thinking, just seems like it's just me, but I'll do it anyway. <laughs> how many had that happen? Eh? Come on, be honest about that. That's right. Okay. And, and there's a part in which it was you, because you've had to give expression to something God was giving you. So it was, it was a thought in your head. So you identified as your thought, and you had to speak it, that's why you think it's just your thoughts. We can receive thoughts from our heart. We can receive thoughts from the Holy Spirit. We can thought, receive thoughts which are demonic. But we were in an atmosphere of faith and expectancy. And so even though you may have doubted that it was God and didn't recognize it was God, I got everyone to put their hands up to say that they were touched by what you shared. So you know that even though it felt like it was just you, for the person receiving... They got a touch from God through your prayer. So you come to realize God could be speaking through me and I don't recognize it because I didn't sort of feel anything big. Remember, it wasn't for you. It was for them. So that's where there's this faith element in it where we're trusting God because God is good. God loves people. 
God wants to help and encourage people. God is willing to use any person to do that. We believe that, therefore, without us feeling any great emotions, God can work through us, and we don't necessarily feel anything, except maybe later on, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. I just feel awful. <laughs> but, but actually, God touched someone in spite of that. And after a while, you learn to work with the Holy Spirit without needing to feel any great feelings or experiences. We operate by faith. Any idea? Okay. How many enjoyed that as a good starter experience? That wasn't too hard, was it, eh? See, so what we'll do is we'll gradually grow the experiences you have. But it all works off the same thing, activating your spirit, settling your mind, listening for the spontaneous, identifying it, and then sharing what you have and allowing if there's more comes, to let the more come. And then when you feel it stops flowing, just stop. It will get you to do more and more of that. You might be quite surprised how easily you'll receive. Remember, you're made for this. This is not foreign. This is only a little unusual because you haven't done it. But it's actually your design. That's why we laid the Bible foundation. You're designed for this. Okay? And I had the privilege of praying for a dear lady here tonight, and you got quite touched too, didn't you? Yeah. Felt the presence of God. Why don't you come up and just share with everyone what happened? Come on, just come on up here where everyone can see you. That's right. You were telling me how you've been. You're a new Christian, is that right? Yes, I am. Yes, I did an Alpha course at Village Baptist in Havelock North, and I was brought up a Catholic. Wow. And I had a faith that never really grew. I believed in God from being born. From right, being a yes. Little girl. And I was in a strict family. Um, and never quite good enough. And... I was married, and again, in that relationship, I could never quite match up to what I yeah. was expected to be. Um, and as a new Christian, I've now got a faith that's a living faith, and it's within me, rather than fear of that's hell and damnation. And yes. It's all right if you Wonderful. Can, you know, to charities and live a good life, but that's not what it's all about. It's a warm, contented feeling now. Uh, with God, yeah. So she was sharing with me how she had, she was a Christian for 18 months and had been praying to hear the voice of God and experience Him. And for 18 months, so she's come tonight wanting to hear the voice of God and experience His love, and she was feeling emotional after I prayed for someone else. So I offered to pray for her. And when I prayed for her, God began to give me some words of knowledge. Getting very hot. <laughs> hot is good. Hot is good. Hot is the Spirit of God resting on you. Yeah. Okay. And the word that the Lord gave me was that she struggled to be good enough. And that from when she was very young, she was criticized and was never found to be good enough and had struggled all her life to be good enough. And God wanted to know he accepted her and loved her. Isn't that wonderful? Now, only God could know those sorts of things. And, of course, as I spoke then, she began to be quite touched. And you're still being touched at the moment. I am, yes. Yeah, yeah. Apart from the fact that I've got the most beautiful and caring and loving husband now that's given, helped me find the Lord. Yes. And given me a peace and contentment that I've never known. And he has helped the Lord. Let's give him a clap, life. shall we? That's a fantastic... <laughs> Come on. Come on I'm so glad you came. So undoubtedly over to tomorrow, there'll be a lot more of this happen. And that's what we came for. We came to hear the voice of God and to be able to flow with the Holy Spirit. And you see the, 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 the tremendous blessing you can be if you can interact with people and get something from God that only God knows that can touch their heart. And I'll, I'll Practice with you tomorrow, and whatever I ask you to do, I'll do it for you first so you can see it operating, and then you practice and have a turn at it. Okay? Well, we're getting to the end of the evening, so perhaps rather than do any more, perhaps to just give an opportunity if any of you had some questions you wanted to ask. We may cover it tomorrow, of course, but some of it we may be able to cover just right now. So if you had any questions you wanted to ask, I think one or two had some in the break they came up to me. 
So uh, if you had a question to ask, then if you could stand and speak it out, and I'll repeat it so that the camera picks it all up and do my best to answer it. There's no bad questions, but there can be inadequate answers. So I will do the best I can to answer pro well, <laughs> as best I can. So anyone had some questions I wanted to ask uh, before we finish the session? Yes, okay then, thank you. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right, yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. No, no, no. The Bible. Yes. Sure. Firstly, we, it's, although it's useful to consider spirit, soul, and body as three separate things, they are actually quite integrated together. In other words, you separate your spirit and soul from your body, then your body dies. The Bible talks that it requires the word of God to separate your soul and spirit, Hebrews 4. So clearly the soul and the spirit are quite closely bound together. When Jesus talked about uh, the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man died and was buried, and, his, and, and the Bible says he, 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 he awoke in hell, virtually. Now, in hell, he had memories. He remembered his family, he remembered his brothers, he remembered Lazarus, he remembered the experiences. There's no indication it was a parable, so it's quite likely it was a real person. So the insight that we would get from that is that when a person dies... Their soul, which is separate but connected to their spirit, carries with it the memories of their life. Your spirit and soul use your body to interact with the physical world. So my understanding of memories is that uh, experiences that we have are imprinted chemically in the brains. And so there's a chemical imprint left from experiences. Uh, in fact, actually, your memories are made up of the chemical imprints that go into the brain. But there must be a retaining of them. There must be a mind of the spirit. There must be some way that all of these things are retained in such a way that when you die, even though your brain now ceases to function and, and returns to dust, the person still has all their consciousness. So it would appear to me as though, According to scripture, your soul and spirit are separate but strongly connected, requiring the word of God to separate and work out the difference. It seems to me as though the soul, uh, when you enter the spirit life, your spirit man, the soul is the person residing there in there. Uh, the body seems to be used by spirit and soul as a way of engaging and living in the physical world. Quite interestingly, that demonic spirits, when they enter a person, will enter in and get an, uh, involved in the body part of the person or around the soul in some kind of way. It seems to affect both areas. So the Bible isn't clear on all aspects of how it works, but it does seem to indicate that spirit, soul, and body are quite distinct, yet they are integrated to work together. They will separate at your death, but be reunited in resurrection. How God does it all, I, I really can't answer. I can only give as much as I have learnt from the Bible or learnt through some of the uh, stuff we've looked at in, in the science field. Science has been able to identify that your memories, for example, form like physical trees inside your brain. And that actually memories, when they shift the shape and formation of those neuron trees, all change. Some really interesting research has been done lately on that. But beyond that, I, there's a lot that God doesn't say and I don't know either. Um, so I, I think... You know, you can just 
we need to research and look into the, those areas a bit further. But that's about the, where my understanding of it is. So I see spirit, soul, and body quite separate. Uh, the body refers to each one. Uh, you may be sanctified spirit, soul, and body. seems to refer to each one as a separate thing. But I don't think soul and spirit are easily separated. So my understanding is when a person dies and goes into eternity, their form is their spirit man, identical to the form of their physical body, and the soul somehow is directly connected into that. So the person's like a living person, except they're not living in a physical body. They have their existence in the spirit world now. That's the best I can explain it, I think. Hope it helps. <laughs> okay, anyone else like to ask some things just about what we've covered tonight? Okay, then we've got time for one more practice. Otherwise, if anyone's got a question, we'll go for the question, or we'll get another practice. Okay, you all going to have another practice? Yeah. To find seven. The thing is, you only get good if you practice. And, and keep me on practice. So basically, you want to take this position. Every time I get a chance to pray for someone, I will. And I'll look for the chances. And when I get an opportunity to pray, if I know the, the need the person has, just because they tell me their need doesn't mean that's their real need or all that God wants to say, I'll listen to God for something for them. We should make it our practice that we're going to do it. Now, the thing that seems to be the trouble for everyone is something like this. I'll just come on up here. This is where the crunch point comes for almost every person. And so help, if you can be aware of it, it helps you to realize it's normal to go through this. If I, can I, can I, can I practice on you? Yes. Eh, wonderful, can I take your hand? Thank you. All right then. Now, at this point now, the dilemma is, am I conscious of God or not? If I'm conscious of my failures, I suddenly feel terribly distant from God right now. And I've got to do something. And so now I feel under pressure to perform. Now, when a person's under pressure to perform, they don't flow from their spirit. They will just try to perform. And there's no life in it. So I might then, and what I'll do is I'll be religious. Oh, God, just bless her. Father, Lord, you know her needs. Lord, you just help her tonight and touch her. Now, it sounds nice, but there's no life in it whatsoever. I'm actually not engaging her. And I will talk about that tomorrow in one of the sessions about engaging with people as you minister to them. So what I need to do is just direct my attention to the Lord. Now, if you build a devotional life and you maintain your intimacy with the Lord and, aware, and increase your awareness of him in day-to-day -day life, what happens when you come to minister is it's only a short thing to just relax, just drop into your in a man, into your spirit, oh, thank you, Lord, you're there. Now, Lord, you know her needs right now. Oh, just pour out your spirit upon her. Whew, Holy Spirit, just come on her right now. Jesus' mighty name. Become conscious of God, and the presence of God comes on her, and she's starting to feel the presence of the Lord. Now, I could reach in, just come back a little and just do it again. So now I'll just become conscious of the Lord. All I've got to do is just to stop and begin to think, well, Lord, you know where she is, you know her need. Just show me how to help her. What do you want to say to her, Lord? So I'm inquiring of the Lord. I'm in a place not of struggling, but of listening and inquiring. Holy Spirit, I know you love her and you know all about her. What would it be that you'd want to say to her? How would you want to help her? Oh, and then immediately a word came to mind. So now I says, I've got one word. I know that God is... If you've got the seed, you've got the tree. It's just growing it. That's the thing. Okay, so I've got one seed. So I'll turn it into, I'll begin to pray. And as I pray, I'm not struggling to make anything happen. I'm just allowing my heart to flow to her, towards her with love. Allowing myself to just be aware God loves her very deeply. Oh, thank you, Lord, that you love her. Very precious to you. And you know the struggle that she's been having recently. I'm asking, Lord, that you would bring around her life a refreshing awareness of your presence that you'd bring your peace around her life and that she would rest from the struggles of trying to do so many things. She'd begin to learn the things that you wanted to do and learn how to say no. Lord, today I just release your peace into her life. Let the peace of God flow like a river to her now, in Jesus' name. Okay. All right, now what do you think the word was that the Lord gave me? Peace was one word, yes, that, that, but didn't come first. The first one was struggle. struggle. Okay, can we talk about that? 
Okay, so how, what impact did that prayer have on you? Was it, was it relevant for you? Okay, has there been a struggle going on? There has been a struggle. I asked the Lord, because all I got was one word, struggle. And then uh, I, I, st I thought, I've got to do better than that. What is the struggle about? So I asked, the, as I'm talking, and I got the word, so I'm asking the Lord, what is that struggle about? And I, and so many things to do, and so many pressures, and so many things to be done. And of course, it leaves you then drained and strange. Eh? So then, then, then the flow came out that way. Yeah. And then with the word from God came the presence of God which you started to feel and get touched. You're still feeling it, isn't that right? Yeah. <laughs> you want some more? No. <laughs> yeah, okay, why not? <laughs> See, that was a silly answer, wasn't it, eh? That was a, no, no, it's all right. No, no. I want you to lift your hands up to the Lord. There it is. And so, again, in, in ministering to people, we, we are ministers of the Spirit. So what we're doing is we're receiving from God, reaching into God, reaching to inner man, and just... Our God, just touch your life. So we're receiving from God and releasing to someone. We are a channel. We stand on earth between earth and heaven to bring heaven into earth. How about that? That's what Jesus said. Pray your kingdom come. That your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what we see in the spirit or hear or feel God doing, we release it to the person. And what I've done is I've tried to put it in ways which are visual so you can literally see it happening. But you do need to understand, even if you don't see that, the same thing happens. Even if she never fell over, this is what's going on. So I've asked the Lord to help me have demonstrations which help you see it. So you sort of, you could almost like you could see something just flow like a river like that. Whoa. It's amazing, isn't it? But what really is going on is it's just from being joined to the Holy Spirit, his presence comes out to touch people. Okay, ready to practice on someone. Come on, you've just got another three minutes. You're just about time to fit in one more practice. Come on, let's do it. Find a different person. Can I practice on you? All right, can we just get some feedback from you now? How many people were quite touched by what was prayed? It was just right for you. Just raise your hands if that was you. Well, that's fantastic. Absolutely wonderful. Let's give you all a big clap then. All right, just before you, just before you finish up tonight,